It's my honor to welcome you to today's session, Finance, Black and Stock, Exploring Financial Markets for Wealth Building. I'm Hugh Allen, Regional President for the Mid-South at TD Bank, America's most convenient bank. And I'd like to thank the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for the opportunity to partner and sponsor on today's event. You know, we're gathering at a time when Black communities and allies around the world demand that we confront the realities of anti-Black racism in all aspects of society. At TD Bank, we are aligning our businesses, our philanthropy, and our human capital to address social inequities and open doors for a more inclusive and sustainable future for our colleagues, our customers, and our communities. Barrett Masrani, who is Group President and CEO of TD Bank Group, has pledged to double the number of black executives at TD Bank by the end of 2022. TD is also investing to help address the immediate and long-term impacts of racism through our TD Ready commitment, which is our global corporate citizenship platform where we support black-led and black-focused initiatives for positive change in our communities and for a more equitable tomorrow. Financial security is also a cornerstone and focus of TD Bank, as we provide the tools and the programs to boost financial confidence in our communities. So on behalf of TD Bank, I'd like to thank you for allowing us to join this collective journey of learning and to be a sponsor and a partner for this event. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Patrice Johnson, the Vice President for the Center for Policy Analysis and Research and Leadership Institute for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I am pleased to welcome you to this year's finance session stewarded by our very own CBC fellow, Rachel Gentry. Rachel is a practicing attorney who specializes in finance. She joined us last year and she is currently operating in Rep Horsford's office. So this year's topic for our finance session is Black in Stock, a conversation on wealth building. I couldn't be more thrilled for this topic because our ultimate goal is to advance the global Black community. And this topic is surely timely. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our finance fellow, Rachel Gentry. Greetings, everyone. I'm Rachel Gentry, and I am delighted to welcome you all to AOC's finance session, Black in Stock, Exploring Financial Markets for Wealth Building. During today's session, there will be plenty of discussion about stocks, cryptocurrency, and how their, how their uh, markets operate in order for Black Americans to take advantage of generational wealth. Today, we will hear from our distinguished panelists and moderator as they provide us with their knowledge of the financial markets and how to build wealth from passive income in the Black community. Before we dive into the discussion, I would like to introduce you all to Congresswoman Nikema Williams from the great state of Georgia. Congresswoman Williams serves as a member of the House Financial Services Committee, where she is the vice chair of the Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight. She has been doing a wonderful job serving as Georgia's fifth congressional district and continue to uplift the legacy of her mentor and predecessor, the late Congressman John Lewis. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Congresswoman Nikema Williams. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rachel. It's great to be here virtually for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Annual Legislative Conference. And y'all, I am so looking forward to next year when we can safely meet in person once again. One of my top priorities in Congress is closing the racial wealth gap. As a member of the Financial Services Committee and a subcommittee on diversity and inclusion, I'm making sure that we get that done. Y'all, I know firsthand how hard it is to get ahead without access to financial services because I've been unbanked. Lacking a basic financial vehicle is not unique to me. 
Nearly 14% of all Black households in this country are unbanked. In the greater Atlanta metro area, lack of access to banking is so prevalent that in April, we were one of two cities where the FDIC launched an awareness campaign to encourage Black and Hispanic populations to open bank accounts. These are the lived experiences that I draw from every day when I create policies that center the financial well being of those who are most marginalized. Investing is a critical tool to help my constituents and folks all across the country achieve their financial goals and ultimately close the racial wealth gap. Everyone needs to be able to put their money to work for them, no matter the size of their bank accounts. Investing should be an accessible tool for both the haves and the have nots so that people at any income level can grow their wealth. When we expand access to home ownership, basic banking, affordable and sustainable credit, and responsible financial services, important life goals like sending our kids to college and preparing for a decent retirement can come within reach for many families for the first time, especially in communities of color. And as the financial services landscape changes, it's important that Congress is ready to write the rules of the road while the road is being built. As banks and other financial institutions, institutions use new and emerging technologies, such as artificial intelligence in their lending algorithms or offer new products such as cryptocurrencies, we must ensure that they are not discriminatory or predatory and that they are properly regulated with robust consumer and investor protections in place. When I'm making decisions about policy that impacts financial services, I keep the following two basic principles in mind. First, does the policy foster greater inclusion in the financial system, helping uplift all of us and give everyone an opportunity to build wealth? Second, are there appropriate consumer protections in place so that no one is unfairly disadvantaged or open to predatory behavior based on any changes? As opportunities expand for historically underserved communities to build their wealth from investing, policy must be geared toward including and ensuring a level playing field for people of color and other marginalized communities. That's how we're gonna accomplish big goals like closing the racial wealth gap in this country. Closing the racial wealth gap will do more than just put more money in people's pockets. It'll help create a more just country because the inequities that we see today are often the result of historic policies created to disenfranchise people who look like me. But that's why I'm in Congress, to be a force for justice and an agent for change. Working together with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, people like, like Goom, Givan, Cleve, and everyone joining us today, I am confident that we will deliver results for the people, bringing more economic prosperity to more Americans. Thank you so much, and I look forward to exploring financial markets for wealth building with today's panelists. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Williams, for those wonderful remarks for today's session. I am confident that our moderator and panelists will keep up this momentum as they educate us today. It is now my honor to introduce you all to our moderator to today's session, Nagum Su, founder and CEO of NLS Consultants LLC, where she provides holistic strategic brand marketing and development for athletes, artists, entertainers, and corporate clientele. In 2015, she attended her first Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting as a guest of Mr. Warren Buffett. And as a result for her passion for finance grew, she decided to start a company called the Plutocrats to help educate women of Black and of African American culture of the finance. She is absolutely the proper person for today's session, and I am pleased to introduce her to you all. So if you would like to welcome me and joining Rachel, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd love to thank the CBC Foundation for hosting us and for allowing us to really share this information. Um, I know that everything you're going to learn uh, from Ms. Cleve as well as from Mr. Kevon um, is going to be exciting and entertaining, but it's also going to be extremely informative so that we can all um, learn the next best steps and get some tips and some tricks and just really an overall better understanding of how to have a better relationship with our finances. 
Um, so with that said, I would love to uh, make a quick introduction of, of each of our panelists. Um, I'd love for them each to say a little something about um, themselves and what brought them here. Um, and ladies first, let's start with you, Ms. Cleet. Ms. Clef. Well, thank you for joining me. Thank you for, thank you to CBCF. And I'm thrilled that Congresswoman Williams could welcome us in this important conversation. As you mentioned, I'm Clev Mesador. I lead the National Policy Network of Women of Color and Blackchain. I actually work at the intersection of policy and blockchain and cryptocurrency. I'm a consultant for the Blackchain Association. In my work, I focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in crypto. And for me, you know, as a Gen Xer, as a Black woman, I love cryptocurrency because I do think it represents a great opportunity for you know, people of color, women of color. So I'm excited about this conversation. I should say that I actually have a Capitol Hill background. I worked on Capitol Hill. I used to work for Congressman Barbara Lee and Betty McCollum. So, it's great to be able to reconnect with my Capitol Hill roots and bring crypto to this conversation. Yes, I love that. I love the sound of it. I can't wait to get into talking crypto a little bit more, hopefully a little NFT and yes. definitions are going to be super helpful here. So please be ready for those. Uh, Mr. Kivon, I would love to hear um, and get an introduction from you, your words, uh, please. Sure, thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, Kevon Chisholm Esquire, and I have two titles currently. Um, I'm president of Black Wall Street Consultation Services, where our motto is building wealth through investment clubs. And we help individuals start uh, and organize investment clubs where they invest in the stock market. And we also are um, executive director of Junior Wall Street Inc. Uh, which is our uh, financial literacy component. And we host financial literacy camps for youth. Um, actually, we're currently hosting a financial literacy camp, financial literacy and investing camp. And we just launched a Forex and cryptocurrency camp that is currently going on now. And we have about uh, seven campers that are currently enrolled in that camp. And they're really excited about learning about uh, cryptocurrency. I love the sound of that. So I have young sisters. So please add number eight, nine, and 10 to your list because they <laughs> absolutely, they've got to be there. I, I've, I've sent them to finance camp um, summers before and I've really truly enjoyed it for them. They've actually come back and said, well, math class is boring now. We want to talk money. So I love the sound of that. I love that you're investing in our youth. Um, Ms. Cleb, I love that you are investing in our Black women. That is something that I pride myself on with the plutocrats, you know, having taken groups to, um, to Omaha, to hang out in Omaha and learn about finances from Mr. Buffett and uh, Ooh, awesome. Mr. Munger and all of those folks. But um, I'd love to start with the basics. If we can uh, hop in a little bit to some of the basics and talk about what would an investment portfolio even look like? What is an investment portfolio? I'd love to hear from both of you to really start to formulate what that, what that means, what it looks like to start one. Am I putting all my eggs in one basket? Please, Ms. Ms. Klee, or Ms. Klee, excuse me. Um, I'd love to hear from you again. Well, I, I always want to have Kivan. Everyone's going to butcher my name, so Kavan, I forgive me. But I always think that we should start with a, a lens of traditional finance, which he'll talk to, and I could fill in the gaps. But really quickly, I do want to start with a basic d definition of cryptocurrency. You know, I always like to tell people that, you know, blockchain is technology that that securely verifies information, facilitates the exchange of value without third parties. Right? Just technology securely verifies information, which is the ledger, facilitates the exchange of value, which is the cryptocurrency, and, and, and without third party, that's decentralization. Cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, which we'll talk about in terms of investment, we have to think of them as the light, right? That beautiful light, the light bulb, right? Everybody loves the light. You can buy a $5 light bulb or a $500 light bulb. But what powers the light is blockchain. What powers the light is electricity. So I want people to think of, think of all of the other things we do with electricity other than the light. So same thing with cryptocurrency. But, but I would say, you know, a cryptocurrency port portfolio for everybody looks different than traditional finance because 
it's a different way of thinking about money. It's based on your relationship with money. And it's a different way of investing your disposable income. You know, as we get into the conversation, I encourage, you know, people who are like me, Black people, Black women, but people of color as well, to be responsible, to start conservatively, because this space has a high learning curve, and we want to make sure people do not lose their hard-earned income. So I would say, for me, I'd say if you're new to crypto, investing starts with $10, but no more than $25 just to get your feet wet. And I would recommend starting with Bitcoin. Don't explore yet. Get to know the space before you start going into all coins. I hope that's helpful. Absolutely, absolutely. I'd love for you to second that, uh, Mr. Kivan, if there is some additional um, terms that you can put in front of us uh, for this, that would be so helpful. Yeah, I'm, I'm, gl I'm actually glad that we, we <laughs> she recommended that starting small because I really think we need more financial literacy in our community first, and uh, we 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 are struggling with with just basic financial literacy, and our and that's why we have the financial literacy camp, and uh, we teach the kids the, the importance. Uh, Representative Williams mentioned about banking, so she talked the unbanked. So we we teach kids and. Uh, we try to teach as many in our community, but it's basic concepts, right? About banking and, and budgeting, right? And 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 an and emergency fund. Emergency fund is big, right? Before we get to the investing, we try to teach this all beforehand because you uh, you should not be investing if you do not have an emergency fund. My my belief is you, you if you don't have a six three to six months of your expenses set aside in case of an emergency, right? So, um, but after that. Uh, I um uh, if the the portfolio the, your question what does a diversified portfolio look like I I um I we we uh, I'm I'm a big investor in stocks um and ETFs I'm a big investor in exchange traded funds um and uh we and we also again we teach our kids that so I like I like that and um. Uh, and I'm getting, I'm new to crypto. So like you said, so I started off small. So and that's all right, right. So you start off small, but I think the diversification, uh, having a little bit of everything and I'm, and I, um, my, my, uh, my wife and I, we also have real estate. Um, I think having, if you, if you're able to have some type of investment property in your portfolio. And the reason why I say this is because it, it, it's sort of the way the market is, is one goes down, one goes up and stuff. So you kind of protect it. So I like to try to truly be diversified as much as I can with, with, with the funds that I do have. I love the sound of all of this. So um, for those of you that are listening, we have heard a few things here. So when we talk about a portfolio, we're not just talking about one thing or, or another. The portfolio can be the full gamut of something like cryptocurrency, um, our stocks, different types of stocks, such as the ETS, which are the exchange trading funds, and then real estate. Real estate is a, a form of investment. And there are several others. So thank you both for um, including this um, in this portion of, of talking through what your portfolio is going to look like. Um, so I'd love to touch a little bit more um, on the, the cryptocurrency. Can we speak a little bit about how is it traded? Like, does it even really exist? Like, how do we keep track of things like this? Because again, like it, it, it continues to, as you mentioned, it fluctuates, it goes up and down. And so that's maybe why it's important for us to start with small amounts. And then as Mr. Kivon said, uh, look to expand upon your, your financial literacy. But can you talk to us a little bit more about that? How is it traded? How has it moved through the market and, and, and so on from there? Yeah, so I like to think of cryptocurrency, but we'll start with Bitcoin because most people know about Bitcoin. Yeah, right. I think of Bitcoin, which was which was the first cryptocurrency mine, which started with a white paper in 2008. And if people don't know, that was the same year President Obama was elected. It was the same year of the financial crisis. But you know, I like to think of, of, of Bitcoin as digital cash. Right? Because it has a lot of the same components, the same, it's intended. So when you pay something with cash, it gives you privacy, gives you autonomy. You have control over your money. You hand that dollar for the banana and that's the end of the transaction. Right? So, so, so Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies are intended to be you know, a digital currency, but that gives you much more financial freedom. And I mentioned decentralization earlier. That's intended to say similar to the cash, there's not a 
a fee for you to maintain your account, right? I have a, you know, Bank of America account. Yeah, you charge a fee for this. Oh my God, I overdraft. So, so in terms of the financial freedom, there's less third parties that are, that are charging you fees and such. So, so it's, think of it as digital currency, but a lot of people think of it as an investment, but it doesn't have to be an investment. Right, right now, cryptocurrencies, they're traded, but they're also tr used for transactions. You can buy, mm. you know, you can buy mm. Starbucks. You can actually, many universities will let you pay for your tuition with cryptocurrency, mm. right? Mm. So there's a large learning curve, which means that, you know, it, I first learned about Bitcoin when I was in the Obama administration and I was a, a political appointee. And in 2013, a friend had a Bitcoin project. I first learned about Bitcoin then, but did not get involved until 2015 because it took two years to understand it. So, mm -hmm. so when you think about digital, digital cash, like Bitcoin, like other cryptocurrencies, I say start small. You can buy them on, on decentralized exchanges like Gemini or Binance US, but you can also buy them on PayPal or Cash App or right. even Robinhood. Now, there are some limitations when you buy on Cash App or PayPal or Robinhood, and, and there's much more freedoms when you do do a decentralized exchange, exchange like Gemini or Binance US. But I would tell people that at the end of the day, think of it like money. You know, It's good to think of it like an investment, but it's also good to think about it as something you transact with, you pay things. And you know, for, for listeners out there, if you have an e-commerce business, you can start by creating a merchant account and start accepting cryptocurrency. So you can access this whole new marketplace and oh, consumers. Wow. Nice, nice. I love the sound of all of this. Oh my goodness. So, so we were learning about how to save, how to spend, how to share um, both information and the actual uh, cryptocurrencies as well. Um, it, it was mentioned that it is a digital currency, but it's not the same as online banking. So there are some differences there. Um, it was also mentioned that there, uh, it, that Ms. Ms. Clev, you took two years to go through and learn this process. So patience, patience is definitely a virtue when it comes to uh, taking your time and understanding this. Um, so I'd love to switch gears just a, just a tiny bit, uh, Mr. Kivan, actually really sticking with the, the form of education. We've seen that young black uh, community, uh, in our black communities, uh, we're now participating a little bit more, um, actually exponentially more um, in both, yes, the crypto space and then just overall investment space. I'd love to hear some of the pros and cons of, of, uh, of trading, whether it's day trading or it's just your stock investments and things that you're teaching alongside of that with the education. Oh yeah, it's just <laughs> pros of it. It, it can be addictive. <laughs> um, I mean, you, you so that that's the, in, in a funny way, well, in a good way too. But I mean, it, it, the, the scary thing is that you can make a lot of money. You can also lose a lot of money. And that's why we, we like to caution how, caution how you invest. And, and um, one of the things we like to teach our kids and uh, how I started is by investing in products that you know, or we like to teach kids to track stocks. Like we gave an assignment yesterday, we had all the kids track, come in with stocks that they're gonna track, right? And some of them came in with Nike, Amazon, um, Target, Walmart, right? And Sony. And all of these they can relate to, right? So, um, you know, they play PlayStation. PlayStation is owned by Sony, you know, Amazon. We know Amazon, right? One of the kids said he chose Nike because he likes wearing Nikes. Mm -hmm. So we like to get them to, and, and what we try to do is we like to try to encourage uh, the kids and, and adults that we come in contact with to be investors more than consumers. So invest in the products. You wanna, you wanna, you love Apple? Well, use some of that money Rather than buying a most expensive phone, buy a cheaper Apple phone and invest in the Apple stock. Mm -hmm. And then years down the line, you'll be able to, you know, get a nice, a really nice Apple phone with that. So we, we really try to encourage that. And um, but and and so it's fun, but right, I think I think what's happening now is it's great to see more of us investing in in uh, in Bitcoin and you know other types of cryptocurrency, and and the reason why you see that is because there's so much debt, like the student loans out there, people are chasing trying to pay off debt, but I, um and that you know 
I guess it varies in opinions if that's the best approach because in the long, you don't know what will happen in the market. And that's the concern, right? Like this morning, technically, right? When I started the camp, our account, our investment club account was up $1,400, right? <laughs> 14, what, right? I told the kids this, by one o'clock, it was back down to $500. Oh. So it was like, you, you know, but in, a, in, but in the greater scheme of things, and it's important that we understand this, it's the long run. Right. I'm not a day trader and, and, and I'm not me personally, but I'm confident that some of our kids will be day traders and they can kind of figure that out. I haven't. And I'm, I'm fine with being a long term trader, but I think there's enough of the information if we just not be hesitant and afraid like we have been like we we, we are always been invested in the, the stock market via our retirement accounts. But then we don't manage our retirement accounts. How do I know me? 15 years ago, I just used to put my money in when I started working and just leave it. And one year I made $100,000. That same year y'all mentioned 2008, I lost $100,000 out of my retirement account just for not watching it, right? That's the fear. So literally now I am really playing catch up. When I say catch up, because of my age, I'm putting additional money into my retirement account. So that's, that's, that's a joy. But I will say from the stock market, that's, that's probably how my wife and I, 529 plan, are going to pay for our child's college education or private school education from by investing in the stock market. You touched on so many things. My goodness, I've got so many more questions. I mean, you touched on 529s. I've got younger sisters. They've got theirs as well. But not everybody knows what a 529 is. Can you go into that a little bit? And then I'd love to touch on a few other things that you mentioned. Yeah, 525 are normally state-run plans that are specific for um, higher education, I will say. But not only college, because we use ours actually for our child, we, in, for private school, elementary school um, uh, education as well. And it's just a fund and it's, it's, it's invested in the stock market that each state has that you put money in. You could do it monthly that invests in a stock market. So you have money to pay for your uh, child's college education. Now it could be aggressive, moderate. It could be based on tuition. They have a whole slew of different plans you can, you can participate in. Uh, since we are, I mean, I consider myself to be kind of aggressive, our fund that we invest in for our son is really aggressive. But like I said, I mean, we're not really wealthy at all, but we just try to use our resources the best way we can. So since we sent him to a private school, we took out a portion of that money to pay for his tuition. Um, and, and, and most states have them. Virginia, I'm, I'm in Virginia and Virginia, uh, it's called Virginia 529 plan. And so that's how we, we support that. And we put money in um, as often as we can, to be honest. I love that. I love that. So school will be paid for. <laughs> That's what you're saying. School will be paid for. Future plans will be funded, if you will. And yes. you're going to give your child or children a leg up. That, that's something that all of us should be considering. And if, uh, I can, yeah, oh, yes, please. if I can follow up on a comment that Yvonne made, which I think is very important. It is, you know, understanding your risk level, which is so important. And I find that for women, for Black women, you know, our risk level is, it, it is very conservative when it comes to investment, which is one of the reasons where, why, and I think Kavan mentioned earlier as well, why financial literacy is so important. And Congresswoman Williams in her remarks you know, she mentioned how that consumer protection is one of the big priorities because I, again, I do think that, you know, we are risk averse as people of color, as, as black people, but we realize that we can no longer afford to be left out. We can no longer afford to not be taking advantage of all of these innovative financial instruments that can actually allow us to do the wealth building that we've longed to do. But it, it, it does require, you know, take more risks conservatives risk, but also, you know, you know, focus on financial literacy, learn as much as you can, and learn about options like the 529 program. I'm not a parent, but I, you know, my, my siblings have kids and, you know, they're making full use of it. So I do think that as, you know, as Black people, we have to diversify our understanding of money and how we actually invest and transact our funds. Yes, I totally agree. Good, 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 good. So we should be considering 
uh, buying the company Apple versus just buying Apple products. We need to consider buying the company Nike versus just buying Nike shoes. We know we love all these products, but it's, it's better to be an owner than a consumer as it was mentioned uh, before. Um, I'd love for us to touch a little on, a little bit more on um, the, the NFTs. We did not jump into that. And I'm super curious because I keep seeing things happen. Again, working in sports and entertainment, I saw that uh, Patrick Mahomes just sold a huge NFT thing, whatever this thing is. And I think it was $500,000. I mean, where could I get in on this? How do I get in on this, please? Um, Club, please walk us through a little bit of this. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, the great thing about crypto is it's so, so diverse and versatile. So, so NFTs are non-fungible tokens. So at the, you know, at the core of any of a crypto project is a token. So uh, NFTs are built on Ethereum, which is a blockchain that actually focuses on open source. They're the ones who, you know, are really building small contracts. But non-fungible tokens are a way for us to actually, you know, for creatives to actually leverage their talent and be able to monetize it, right? So non-fungible tokens is I can create the club coin and my network can actually purchase the club coin, right? And they can redeem that club coin, let's say, for a date with me, right? Or, you know, for me to make them a dinner. So imagine all of the ways. But also there are some, you know, some NFTs that are just well sought after. Like, like for instance, I, I, mean, I believe that Jay-Z, you know, did an F NFT for his first album called Cover. Right. So there's ways that, so when you think of, of creatives and their intellectual property and how they've struggled over the last few decades to actually monetize it, but also, you know, get royalty payments as well, non-fungible tokens are a great way for not just celebrities. In crypto, crypto is such a grassroots movement. And so it has really been co-opted by a lot of celebrities and Wall Street executives. But I tell people all the time, it's really for the culture. Right? W w NFTs became popular because everyday creatives, everyday creators, creators started using them, creating their art and selling them on platforms like Nifty Gateway, not, like where, oh God, Superware, which is another place where you could sell NFTs. So I will say one of the things that I tell people all the time, you know, don't get sticker shocked by the price of Bitcoin because you could buy ten dollars of a Bitcoin, but don't get, oh, you know, don't 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 let the celebrities scare you off as well. It's for you know Patrick Mahomes and Jay Z, but it's really for your child who's an artist. It's really for a young entertainer. These tools are there to empower you, right? Because you're probably not gonna get that big celebrity contract. You're probably not going to get discovered, but you have a strong network. That's your marketplace, right? That's your currency. And you can make them work for you. You don't have to you know, use your influence to promote Apple's products. You can actually create products to monetize your $10,000, I'm sorry, your 10,000 followers, but also, your 10 followers. So NFTs are a great tool for creators, for the creative economy, but also for everyday creators, creatives who are watching this virtual session. I, I love that. I'm, I'm learning so much. I'm taking down some notes. I'm, I'm walking through, okay, what do I have to research next? What do I, how do I get involved? Because I want to have the next Jay-Z bank account and I will start small, <laughs> but I want to get there. I want to get there. He had to start somewhere and so do I. So I love the sound of, of knowing that there is a place to start. With that in mind, I'd love to actually um, ask both of you, um, Clev, very much so on maybe the crypto and um, NFT side, and then keep on um, anything that you can shed light on, on the you know general stocks and ETS. How do we purchase? Like, how do we get involved? And I, I mean, I would love for us to plug maybe if there is um, a black owned platform, I know that we need more. So maybe we're, we're encouraging the next great mind to, to invent something or come up with something or a competitor. But um, I'd love to, to dig into that a little bit more. You did mention some uh, club and Q 
Kivon, you mentioned, I believe you mentioned like the Robin Hoods and whatnot, but I'd love to dig into that a little more. How do we get started? How do we start uh, in investing? Yes. So I have to say this disclaimer, this is not investment advice. I don't want people to say, Clef told me to buy this, but we have to get started somewhere. So so as I said, where you start is where you're most comfortable. So if you, everybody unfortunately has a cash app or PayPal account, I say unfortunately, because we're making money for these people, but cash app, PayPal, Robinhood are good places to start, but there are limitations when you actually want to sell your crypto. So people should do their research, but I recommend buying on, on decentralized exchanges like Gemini and Binance US. They're very easy. It's very easier to to buy crypto now than than when I started, right? So Gemini, it, it's actually the the Workervice twins and Binance US. They're Binance that US, but they're very easy. You can set up an account and you can purchase crypto right away. As I said earlier, don't get sticker shack because you can put crypto on layaway, right? So one Bitcoin, the you know. We, it will fluctuate, you know, with sixty-five thousand dollars, you know, a, a few months ago, and it's probably going to fluctuate around forty thousand this year. But you don't have to buy that amount, ten dollars, so you can put Bitcoin on layaway. There is a market cap on Bitcoin; only twenty-one million will ever be, be mined. And I believe we're almost at the halfway mark. Most people in the world will never own a Bitcoin. So, and unfortunately means most black Latinx people will probably never own one. So that, that is important for you today before the currency is out, buy $10 worth, $25 worth, just to get started, just to have skin in the game. Right? But also I, I will say, you know, this is not for rich people. It's accessible to everybody. You don't have to have a broker. You don't have to, you know, have a, a brokerage account. You just have to create a wallet, a digital wallet. Now, part of your question is, you know, well, maybe it wasn't part of your question. <laughs> There are, lots of black, there. there are lots of black people in crypto. I tell people all the time, women of color are the fastest growing demographic in the crypto ecosystem. There are lots of black products that we can support. Hill Harper recently partnered with a woman of color in, in blockchain to actually launch the Black Wall Street app. It's a digital wallet intended in the premise of Black Wall Street. Come on, you'll, you'll probably appreciate that. Yes. And so it was wonderful that, you know, Hill Harper partnered with Black innovators in this space to create this digital wallet. You can open this wallet, it's free, and purchase your cryptocurrency to there. There's another young woman, Tavonia Evans, who created Guapcoin. Guapcoin is, again, a coin intended for Black people. You can download her app, guapcoin.com, but also you can purchase guap coin which is a coin associated with it as well so there's multiple options i actually published a book for people to learn about crypto it's called the clevolution my quest for crypto (laughs) and and well my, my quest my quest for justice in politics and crypto but there's a there's there's another contemporary i have isaiah jackson who who his book is bitcoin in black america which is a great place to start in terms of just learning so i would say you know as we're patronizing and you know looking at cryptocurrency there are lots of black products out there for us to you know, where you start is with the digital wallet so you can have any digital wallet you want but also you can purchase your, your cryptocurrency, you know, through anyone else. I will say this is where it gets a little tricky because I would love to talk about cold storage, which is how you actually protect your cryptocurrency so it doesn't get lost. But then we'd be getting into the weeds of things. But I would say, you know, once you do purchase a cryptocurrency in any wallet, a black owned wallet or a traditional wa- uh, mainstream wallet from a non-black, um, you know, proprietor, I would say learn about cold storage, learn about how to protect your crypto because that's really, really important. Sorry to monopolize the time. <laughs> no, that's super helpful. It's very helpful information. Um, Kivon, can you walk us through some of the opportunities or options of how to get invested into the stock market and how to even make our purchases for ETFs? Yeah, I'm I'm a little old school and I'll admit that. I'm I'm just not really I'm not really comfortable with apps right now. 
And um, I know, I know you, you mentioned um, black brokerage firms. I know there's Ariel Investments out, out, mm -hmm. out there. And um, I know, I, I think you have to purchase most their investments from them that, and they offer mutual funds, ETFs. Um, and the only reason, and it's uh, Cl Clive, right? Clive. Clive, sorry, Clive. And I, and I agree with Clev is that um, some of the apps are limited, right? So, I mean, they just don't, and, I, and I'm not, I don't teach our kids that, I'll be honest, because they don't provide enough information. And when I look at it, when I go to a, a website, like, um, you know, I, my son, I, my son is an investor. He's been investing since he's 11, he's 14. So um, he has a Charles Schwab account, right? And, but when we go to the Charles Schwab account, we can look at analyst reports. We can look at a whole lot of data before he makes the purchase. And he recently purchased, based on that data, he recently purchased Target. And I suggested that, he, I mean, my assignment for him was, you, I want you to find a stock that pays dividends. Mm -hmm. So he came back with three and we, you know, he's only 14, so I have to walk through the reports with him. So, um, and, and TD Ameritrade is another one, that, you know, they, they Charles Schwab bought them. So they kind of, but they have different, they have different, they offer different services. Like they'll rank an ETF. And I love to be able to go and look at, like ETFs is like a basket of stocks. So they come in different shapes and forms and you can't really get that on many apps. So like, like I like to get as much information and I like to teach our kids, you know, get as much information. Now, after you get that information then, um, but it goes back to what Congress, Congressman Williams said, you need to have a brokerage account, you need a bank account because your brokerage account, so you open up a bank account, you attach it to your broker account. Some banks have brokerage accounts. And then you just really, it's not that hard. You just go on their website with your cash there and buy whatever you want, uh, how many shares you want. Um, you know, we, we help kids because we, my, my son has an account and it's a custodial account. So his parents, we're responsible for it, but he can go on and, and kind of buy and sell and I'll walk him through it. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm, again, I use apps to track my stocks, like the, the daily or track anything. But I just, for other people that are inexperienced, I'm just not really, I haven't really found an app that provides enough, like, like your question, what is an ETF? Like an app that goes through in detail what an ETF is, like the fees, the management fees that come with that, um, the difference between an app a mutual fund and an ETF. There's some apps that do that. So, but you know, it could be my age too, right? <laughs> I'm not a young, I'm not a young, you know, whatever, but um, some of the younger generations that, that kind of work with having limited information. For me, I monitor every trade. I'm like, you know, with the money. So I'm not just going to buy one, someone telling me or, or so social media, Wall Street bets, Reddit saying, buy, buy. I'm, I don't work like that. That's not me. <laughs> You, you're you're someone that thinks for themselves. There's right. nothing wrong with that. <laughs> right. We appreciate that. That's what we want to encourage everyone to do is to think for themselves and and to educate themselves. And to your point, um, it is it is difficult and sometimes strategically so for uh, for us being you know a, a community that is fairly new or newer to this space to get the education that we need. Um, there are fewer of us that are managing uh, managing wealth because uh, historically we weren't known to have wealth to be managed in the first place. So right. um, it is important to to really do your research, especially if you're investing on your own. Um, but as it was recommended, uh, as, as it was mentioned, it is always great to have someone that is an expert in this space to work with you. And I think that that's that's probably a, a across the board a sentiment for all of us. Um, oh. I will say that one of oh, oh, oh I was no. going to say one of the one of the places that I started was Investopedia. I didn't know what an ETF was, and yes, it was internet. So I will say that yes, it was through the internet versus an app. But the internet had lots of information, and 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 looking at reputable sites, I was able to look at what it, what an ETF is. Um, what banking fees in general are, let alone investment fees and how those things are broken down. Uh, what a 401k um, okay. is and how I advance mine. And if I'm self-employed, which I have been for several years, it is important to understand how you're investing in your own 401k and how you use the market to help enhance. Because those of us that are behind, like as you mentioned, uh, Kivon, 
um, we've got to play catch up. And so mm -hmm. sometimes that means you got to be a little more aggressive, but then you also have to know where to kind of hang back a little bit and, and take those, those knowledge points. Um, if I can say something real quick, I know, and I've got one last question for you all. Go, go for it. Now, I want to in, in, interject since we've been talking about ETF so much. There is a lot, there's a few applications with the SEC for Bitcoin ETF. Oh. It's, yeah, it's, it, it has been rejected quite a bit because of, you know, a few issues, but we do anticipate a Bitcoin ETF to be approved by the SEC within the next two years. Grayscale is the comp the largest company that is actually trying to move an ETF in for a Bitcoin ETF. So take a look at Grayscale, but there are quite a, a few other companies as well. But we, you know, the SEC is working through some issues. And in terms of that market research that Kivon mentioned, that's very, very important. So coinmarketcap.com, coinmarketcapcap.com is is sort of like the one the one-stop shop where you can get information on all of the cryptocurrencies out there. And there's like 10,000 of them. But, but also for more savvy investors, more high net worth investors, a lot of you know, tr traditional financial companies offer custodial services for, for high net worth clients. Mm -hmm. So Fidelity is a company that has been investing in crypto, well, have been really looking at crypto for their consumers for a long time. So I always give them credit. There are a lot of other companies who are like Goldman Sachs who are getting into them right now, but Fidelity took the time, you know, quite a while ago. So I just wanted to interject those things. Sorry to interrupt. Absolutely. No, all helpful information. Um, yeah. I know both of you guys have, have touched on um, these things, but I'd love to wrap us with, if you can provide any piece of advice, I know uh, both of you either have books or are working on books. So yes, absolutely plug those, but I would love to know, I'm, I'm a big time podcast junkie. I love listening to podcasts and learning about money through those avenues. Um, but if there is a book, a podcast, a something that um, can help get people either started or help them along their journey, what is it that you can recommend uh, for, for our public? Uh, no, on, go ahead. Uh, uh, oh, excellent question. I, I sometimes forget about my book. <laughs> Um, it's been out for about three years, but my book, uh, I wrote uh, Financial Legacy, um, Building Wealth Through Investment Clubs. Um, and that, that, is, that, that, was, that was how we started, my son and I, I was trying to get um, uh, African-Americans to come together to start investment clubs. So Financial Legacy, Building Wealth Through Investment Clubs is, is my book. And it's actually, I'm happy to say it sold over 500 copies, right? It's downloadable, printable, but I've only been able to get two investment clubs started in, in three years. And it's because of the type of information that we're talking about. It's like the hesitancy of, of, of uh, many, uh, many African-Americans to, to, to start, you know, to invest in, you know, I'll leave that alone. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I like to start with the dummy books. Like the, um, I have this one book here actually, um, that I used, I read years ago, exchange funds for dummies. You know, it's like, I'll start with those, um, you know, to get kind of get me, get my feet wet. But um, I also like um, The Intelligent Investor is, is, one of, is one of the books I enjoy just to kind of, you know, that introduced me years ago. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, um, since I kind of, my foot is, I, I like Invexopedia too. I was actually reading an article from that to prepare for my presentation on financial literacy. So I do, a, I focus a lot on financial literacy now, um, but I'm also an investor. And so I'm, I'm learning as I'm on this panel about Bitcoin and, um, you know, my son, I learned from him. He brought uh, NFTs to me uh, about three or four months ago. And I'm like, I, I, my, my home, I consider a gallery, right? On my wall. So when he came up with this idea. I was like, what? Um, but you got to be open minded. Right. He's like, this is what the tr trend is, dad. So I, like, I try to listen to the young people. And now it's like he's trying to get me to do that. So, yeah, I love that. Miss Whitney Houston always said, teach them well and let them lead the way. Correct. So we've, you're, you've taught him well and now he's leading you into <laughs> new, you know, new avenues. Um, yeah, plus, yeah. I'd love to hear from you. What are some recommendations you may have? Yeah, so as I mentioned, I have my book, The Clevolution, My Quest for Justice in Politics and Crypto. I, Isaiah Jackson has, you know, Bitcoin and Black America. 
He also has a podcast called The Gentleman of Crypto, which is very interesting. There's also, if, if for, 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 for those who are watching, who are on, on, oh my God, Clubhouse, there's a huge Clubhouse group called Black Bitcoin Billionaires. It's become a huge network. So it started as a, club, a clubhouse, Black Bitcoin Billionaires. And now it actually, they have a podcast. They do events across the country. It's a great place for Black people to connect and learn about Bitcoin and actually see the thriving Black community in crypto. And then the last book I would say is, I consider it like the Bible of crypto. It's called The Internet of Money. The author is Andreas Antonopoulos. But the internet of money actually walks you through how we got to crypto because it wasn't just when you look at the financial instruments and how, you know, the, the evolution of fintech and how we've digitized value, the internet of money actually gets you to why crypto makes sense. So I would tell people that start with the internet of money, add, you know, Bitcoin and Black America and definitely add my book. Uh, awesome. Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. I think this is, this is great. This is incredible information. And I'm so excited for all of us to really dive in a little deeper. Um, my big thing, again, with the plutocrats is we have conversations. This should be dinnertime conversation. This should be the conversation that you're having with a good friend. This should be, you know, money should not be a taboo topic. We now are in a place or we are growing as a black community to become a place where we finally will start to have some disposable income. It's no longer the survival mode, but it's the, the mode of thriving. And the way that you thrive is by having this conversation, sharing information. And that's why you all are here to learn. But then this is why um, our wonderful speakers are here so that they can teach, so they can continue to share this information. And with that, I just would love to thank you all for joining us. And, uh, and I'd like to pass it back to Dr. Patrice Johnson. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this amazing session, Black in Stock. Thank you for taking note of all of this of, of wisdom that our panelists, Mr. Kiban and Clef, have shared with us. It is accessible to us. This is uh, knowledge for everyday people that we can immediately start to use in our lives. And then finally, I want to also thank Representative Williams for joining us this morning and sharing her story with us. Thank you to our moderator, Ms. Gum Sue, the founder of the Plutocrats, and then also uh, to our fellow, Rachel Gentry, for helping us to facilitate this session. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everyone. I'm Shonda Robinson, Global Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at GM Financial, the captive finance arm for General Motors. For the last several years, GM Financial has had the privilege of supporting and participating in the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's annual legislative conference, a tradition we're pleased to continue for this year's event. As an industry leader in auto finance and in line with our parent company, we're committed to embracing and fostering a diverse culture where our team members can be their most authentic selves at work and feel seen, heard, valued, and respected. We also know this commitment will show up and show out in our financial performance Prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion is very good for business. From our cross-company mentoring program designed to better develop women and professionals of color to the launch of the company's first HBCU-focused internship program this summer, we are continuing to do the work that will ensure lasting change in our company and communities. That work also includes broadening access to financial resources and knowledge for consumers across the country, understanding that this access is inequitably distributed, particularly in underrepresented populations. Using our financial services expertise, we're working to narrow financial literacy gaps with initiatives like our Keys Financial Wellness Program, which helps people learn to manage money, understand credit, and navigate the dealership and car ownership experience. In closing, on behalf of GM Financial and the GM Enterprise, thank you to CBCF conference leadership and organizers for the opportunity to once again participate in this amazing historic event. We look forward to continuing to listen and learn alongside each of you this week.